I'm reading David Nathan's The Soul for Divas. In this chapter, he's discussing Tony Braxton. Don't forget to hit the like, share, subscribe button, as well as leave a comment. I appreciate your support. Funny the changes that life brings. The, full, the first full interview I ever did with Tony Braxton for Blues and Soul in 1993 sported the heading, The First Lady of La Face. My third interview with her, conducted in 1996 upon the release of her second album, mentioned the same phrase. The April 1998 issue of Billboard contains a news story detailing the latest developments in a round of legal action that began in December 1997. That was when Tony, through her attorneys, filed a suit claiming that she was no longer bound by her contract with LaFace and its joint venture partner, Arista Records. The lawsuit cited a California statute commonly known as the seven-year rule, which automatically puts an end to personal services being rendered to a company. Luther Vandross and Dan, excuse me, Don Henley had filed lawsuits against their respective labels years before as a way of renegotiating original contracts and had been successful. In January 1998, LaFace and Arista countersued in, according to the Billboard story, a spokesperson person for both companies reported that in October 1997, Tony had been offered a $10 million advance, a recording fund of $4.4 million for her third album, an increased royalty rate of 19 percent on new projects and 18 percent on her two previous albums and through her representatives had rejected it in january 1998 tony also filed for chapter 7 bankruptcy amid allegations that she was doing so as another tool to enable her to leave LaFace and arista she went on the oprah winfrey show and explained she hadn't personally kept track of her finances and bills, hadn't signed all her own checks and had debts of more than a million dollars. Oprah was less than thrilled about it all, reminding Tony and the viewing audience of several million that she always maintained total control over her business dealings and strongly urged other performers to do the same. I remember that particular episode. <laughs> I was there watching it. And it's, of course, that episode is known for Oprah Winfrey pretty much chastising uh, <laughs> Tony Braxton, not so much about keeping, you know, track of their finances and uh, of your own finances um, and signing all of your checks, so on and so forth. But she also mentioned, listen, Tony, you had Gucci silverware. I have a lot of money tons of money, and I don't have Gucci silverware. I remember that, and people started laughing. And if I'm not mistaken, I think a couple, some people even applauded. But here's the thing. As I said before, I do remember that. Uh, also, too, I did remember uh, this supposed uh, negotiation where uh, Arista and LaFace Records offered her a $10 million uh, advance, a recording fund of $4.5 million for her third album and an increased royalty rate of 19% on new projects and 18% on her two previous albums. I don't know if they turned that down. It is what it is. I think in hindsight, looking back, I think I would have turned that down as well. You know, because again, you're talking about a $10 million advance. Yeah, what happens if that the album doesn't do well, so on and so forth? Uh, for whatever reason, Tony wanted to break her contract. And if I'm not mistaken, filing bankruptcy would have definitely ended the contract obli contractual obligation she had with Arista and LaFace Records. But anyway, that was a huge thing at the time. It almost make you think of MC Hammer at the time when he was going through what he was going through. You know, I, you know, it's kind of like, okay, we see you doing well. Everything is going great, but don't you think you're spending too much money? And I think that's the same thing with Tony Braxton. It was almost kind of like, don't you think, you know, you're spending too much money, <laughs> you know, but anywho, let's continue to see what David had to say.
She went on the Oprah Winfrey show and explained she hadn't personally kept track of her personal of her expenses and bills, hadn't signed all of her uh, checks and had debts of more than a million dollars. Oprah was less than thrilled about it all, reminded Tony in the viewing audience of several million that she always maintained total control over her business dealings and strongly urged other performers to do the same. The last legal action came from Tony when she asked the bankruptcy court in Los Angeles to declare her LaFace contract unenforceable, alleging that a former attorney, business managers, and personal managers hadn't been working in her best interest in her relationship with LaFace, leading her to financial disarray. Her new manager, Gladys Knight's ex-husband, Barry Hackerson, went on record stating that Except the charges by the labor had resulted in Tony's money woes. Well, you also have to look at it too, you know, when you're going into, you know, a recording and you got these recording budgets and you're thinking everything is, you know, on the up and up and everything you do um, when it comes to recording uh, an album is pretty much looked at as you're, it's being recouped. So again, if you have people coming into the studio and they're drinking, so on and so forth, and you need to ask yourself, like, who, who, who whose dime is that on? Is that my recording budget? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? You're going out on a night on the town. Like, who, who, who who's paying for this? And, you know, sometimes you got these executives and the uh, so on and so forth. People are uh, saying, you know, uh, to you, oh, don't worry about it. Everything's cool when everything isn't cool. You know, especially if this is what I have to recoup because they say, "Hey, th this is this is how we make the album. We, we 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 you know we're going out on the night on the town. I got to see you know what you like, you know what you into, so on and so forth. You 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 never know. We out on the town. We we having a good time. I can might write a song about it. You see what I'm saying? So you just got to look at things that way, uh, so on and so forth. So it is what it is. Um, the legal action." comes from Tony when she asked the bankruptcy court, so on and so forth, Barry Hankerson. Okay. As I read the billboard stories, I was stunned. The contents were a far cry from the conversations Tony Braxton and I had since we met in 1992 when LaFace hired me to work with her as a media coach. Hmm, interesting. I was to train her in how best to handle interviews with the press. The need had arisen as a result of the popularity she was achieving through two duets she'd Recorded with Kenny Babyface Edmonds, the co-founder of The Face with Antonio L.A. Reed for the Eddie Murphy hit movie Boomerang. Awesome, awesome movie soundtrack. During my initial meeting with Tony, I found her to be quite shy and nervous. She'd uh, never been exposed to the press before, and she wasn't sure what questions might be asked of her. It wasn't so much that she had anything to hide. It was more a desire that she came across as articulate and smart. She needed she needed have worry. Yes, Tony was a little timid to start out, out with, but she was clearly no dummy. She was most concerned about personal questions, but I assure her that until her first album came out, she probably wouldn't be asked too much about that side of her life. Tony's arrival at the face had followed a somewhat circuitous uh, route. The Maryland-born daughter of a minister, Tony had only limited exposure to secular music because of her family background. During our first proper interview in 1993, she mentioned how she had to sneak to watch Soul Train when her parents weren't around. I remember the theme that really inspired me to want to sing. I was watching the television program, Good Times, and I had a crush on J.J. Walker. I was, I saw a very young Janet Jackson singer to him, and I figured that if I grew up and became a great singer, he'd fall in love with me too. Interesting. All right, let's move them right along. The label released just one single, Good Life, in 1990, and although it only be, did moderately well, it served as an introduction for Tony to produce her label owners, L.A. and Babyface. The team had created LaFace in 1991 and was actively looking for a female vocalist when it heard Good Life, an audition at which Tony sang and played piano led to an offer to Star Points Phillips. And once she checked in with her sisters, Tony became a LaFace artist. As she explained in 1993, since 
they're all younger than me. They were either in junior high or high school, and they really wanted to complete their education. Tony said of her siblings, they felt this was a big opportunity for me. They were fully behind me and felt I should go ahead. Tony, only concern when she started working with the face, excuse me, LA and Babyface had to do with her own confidence level. My first reaction when I realized I was going to work with them directly was I hope I'm up to the uh, caliber of artists they were uh, they work with. I really wanted them to be proud of me as the first uh, female artist of LaFace. She had little to worry about with the distinct voice that had power and range reminiscent of times of Anita Baker's sultry contralto or Whitney Houston's gospel edge soprano. Tony could really sing, unlike some of the other female vocalists who had gained popularity as the new decade began. You know, I'm also <laughs> want to say, isn't that interesting that we always talk about the divas who can't sing, but we never really talk about them? Right. Like, who are these divas, you know, back in these 80s, so on and so forth? You know, sometimes I want to bring those names up and say, is it this, this diva, that diva, so on and so forth. So who are these divas that people talk about that, you know, can't see? But anyway, let's continue. Tony's only concern was when she started working with LaFace and uh, L.A. Reed and Babyface had to do with her own confidence. Uh, but anyway, moving right along, it was fortuitous for Tony that L.A. and Babyface were working on their first LaFace soundtrack and that it was for a film with strong potential. Boomerang, a comedy starring Eddie Murphy, Halle Berry, and Robin Gibbons was a box office hit. The soundtrack was a bestseller, uh, racking up 3 million sales after its release in June 1992. The soundtrack's success had more than a little to do with Tony. Her deck had more than a little to do with Tony. Her duet with Laborhead and Star in his own right, Babyface, on the song Give You My Heart was not only a number two RB hit, but also a top 30 pop success. With a grin, Tony said, I decided I helped him with his recording career. In reality, the duet was her launching pad, and LaFace followed it up with Tony's solo effort for the soundtrack. The wishful love should have brought you home last night. I remember that when it first came out because uh, I think that that's what started everybody to really want to uh, be like Tony Braxton. Uh, you know, for example, when she first came out, people just literally, well, females were cutting their hair instantly. Like, it was like, oh, I want to get that Tony Braxton haircut. You know, as a matter of fact, my sister was one of the ones who immediately jumped on the bandwagon and cut her hair, you know, <laughs> like uh, Tony Braxton. So there was a lot of that going on uh, at the time. So I remembered it. It was a great time to uh, actually see Tony Braxton um, release uh, an album. Well, well, to come out. And, and not only that, uh, not only was it a good time, uh, you also have to think about the how previous duets with Babyface uh, also set the stage for Tony Braxton, if you think about it. I mean, you had Karen White, you had Pebbles, you know, who um, had duets with uh, Babyface, and there was uh, – great, you know, duets, and they did well. And so when Tony Braxton came along, I think a lot of people were probably thinking about, you know, just the fact that, you know, she was the first lady of the face. But you also have to keep in mind, too, that she was definitely, you know, under some pressure, too, you know, when, when, when the record was released. I'm just talking now from a fan perspective. You know, as a fan of a person, you know, a music buyer, I'm like, wait a minute, hey, Tony, uh, Karen White's, you know, Love Saw It is a big hit, you know, and I love it. You know, uh, Pebbles, uh, Love, uh, what's it called? Uh, love Makes Things Happen. And so now you have, again, Tony Braxton with uh, Give You My Heart. So again, you know, it, it was a lot riding on those duets at the time, you know. So the fact that it was a great duet, it, it, it was awesome. So again, uh, just just great, just great, great. Not only that, when I think about the movie, another thing that made the song popular, not only was it just a great song, and I'm talking about Love Should Have Brought You Home, another thing that stands out about Tony Braxton's um, 
uh, song. It was the title of the song, you know, to see Halle Berry's character say, you know, but you don't give, uh, you don't care about nobody. You only care about yourself. And if it really was love, then love should have brought your, you know, ASS home last night, you know, so <laughs> to take that quote, and then make a, a song out of it and it it resonates i mean it really hits you know and it was such an impactful song and an impactful message you know and then on top of that tony braxton to me looking kind of like Halle berry's character in the uh uh video you know it, it, it was just great it was it was great marketing um to say the least but anywho let's continue uh, the industry scuttlebutt had it that Clive Davis, the head of Arista, the FACES uh, joint venture partner, was less than impressed with Tony's singing style. Of course, we already had he already had his own share of divas. The young superstar went to Houston by the time six years into by this time six years into a monumental career and the legends of Aretha Franklin and Dion Warwick that put even more pressure on the face principles to deliver which they did. Now, let's stop there. You know, now, you know, we can kind of let the cat out the bag. And let me just say, you know, this is me talking. So now it's a leech. But, you know, I'm glad that this came up in this book because a lot of people don't. Oh, how do I want to say it? Uh, there was rumors that Clive Davis passed on, you know, the signing of Anita Baker. Anita Baker was already signed, of course, to a record company uh, with her group Chapter 8, right? But from my reports, from what I gather, from what I've also read, is that Arista purchased Anita Baker's uh, Chapter 8's uh, record company, bought the record company out, as, and of course, you know, bought, you know, uh, Chapter 8's contract. But they were immediately dropped because... Well, where it has it that Clive Davis thought that Anita Baker couldn't sing. And why am I bringing that up? And I think it's a valid point now to make because if we're saying that Clive Davis did not like uh, um, Tony Braxton's singing style and Tony Braxton's singing style is similar to that of Anita Baker's, of course, and she was kind of being, you know, fashion after Anita Baker so uh, a little bit on her first project, being that some of those songs were for Anita Baker. Chances are that, you know, that rumor, if you will, is true that Clyde Davis did not think that uh, Anita Baker could sing. And now we're here with Tony Braxton's singing style. And he was like, I don't know. But see, this just goes to prove the show. If you're packaged package right and, you know, and, and you have some people, some heavyweights behind you, they can really make, you know, make it happen that, you know, these producers who are heavyweight producers, who knows what they're doing, who can put the right image, the right package together, so on and so forth. And even though you have executives of, of these labels who are pretty much like, ah, I don't want to deal with you, so on and so forth. I don't like the way she look. I don't like the way she talk. I don't like the, I don't like her name. Like there's just certain things about her I don't like. But at the end of the day, when it's right, it's just right. You see where I'm going with this? So it is what it is. We can kind of, as I said, move right along from that. But again, I'm glad that it, you know, came up so we can compare the two, if you will. Uh, Tony Braxton included seven tunes that the two hit makers had produced themselves with then partner Daryl Simmons. The album was filled with standout performances like Seven Whole Days. And I say when Seven Whole Days came out, that was me. I would say that's when I could tell say to Tony, "Welcome to Club Diva," because Seven Whole Days was the was the was the ish. A smoldering, smoldering, jazzy ballad that uh, had critics convinced that Tony was the young version of Anita Baker and best friend. A song Tony had co-written and co-produced it with Ernesto Phillips of Starpoint. But beyond the album cuts were the hits, five tunes that jumped out of the album and onto the pop and R&B charts. Uh, apart from Tony's obvious musical skills, she looked fine, slim, hip, and very pretty. For Tony, the album was also about lyrical honesty. The songs on this first record are real, she emphasized when she spoke in 1993. They're about things that people experience in relationships with love, heartbreak, and all that goes along with dealing with everyday situations. The song Best Friend is very personal. 
It's something that happened to me. I was breaking up with this guy and my best friend started dating him straight away. It was like, you finished with him, so I'm having him for myself. And that hurt. Hmm. Yeah. So it is what it is, you know. Um, like I said, it's very interesting, you know, uh, Tony Braxton. But again, you also have to keep in mind that it wasn't much to go on. He didn't write a lot about divas such as Whitney Houston, Janet Jackson, as well as Tony Braxton in this book. You know, uh, other divas in this book had longer chapters uh, in this book. But, well, it is what it is, right? <laughs> and on that note, I want to thank you guys so much for tuning in over here. I appreciate you guys for your support. If you made it this far into uh, my uh, commentary, then I think it's only appropriate for me to ask you guys to hit the like button, the subscribe button, the share button, you know, hang out with me. I really and truly do like your support. And, you know, it definitely goes a long way. Um, also, too, over here, my motto is simple, very, very simple. Put your behind where your heart desires to be. Whenever I leave my mother's presence, she always says to me, baby, remember I love you, but God loves you best. Uh, I look forward to seeing you guys next video. And until then, you should know what to do by now. Take care of yourselves. <laughs>